Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role-playing games and lots of them. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. You can also find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, Facebook and Twitter. There's also an option to join the channel as a member and I welcome any questions you have in the comment section below. If you like this video or this channel, as always, hit that like button and subscribe if you think I deserve it. This episode we shall take a trip to Yggdrasil, the world ash, a tree so mind-numbingly large and magical. It acts as a unique transitive plane that connects the realms commonly associated with the Norse pantheon as well as lots of other planes. Yggdrasil is the source of immense power, primal power, with countless wondrous ecosystems located on and within it that can be found nowhere else. The first edition Manual of the Planes by Jeff Grubb describes Yggdrasil as the astral landmark noting that it is normally encountered by travellers from worlds that worship the Norse gods. It's the nature of the astral realm, the dream stuff, that navigation has a lot to do with who you are and what you believe in. But, of course, any traveller can encounter Yggdrasil as it has a kind of pull of its own, drawing in the living flotsam of the plane as well as lost travellers of the Feywild, Shadowfell and Plane of Dreams. I wouldn't rely on that, but it does happen. Yggdrasil is both a colossal living entity and also a transitive plane of its own that has become a conduit used by the gods and many other races to travel the planes without having to take on astral form for eons. It's very safe to say that you can explore the world ash for decades and every day will turn up something new. There are groups and races who call the world ash home, many more who use it as a safe base of planet operations and more than a few who seek a spiritual connection to the tree itself. The prospect of gaining some of the awareness of the multiverse the World Tree has is a deeply motivating drive for these mystics. Those who do manage this become connected to Yggdrasil and gain incredible power. But since this is a two-way street, such individuals are always beings who have a deeply neutral attitude, who never use this power without a mighty need, one that Yggdrasil shares, which is tricky as nobody can confirm if Yggdrasil is self-aware or not. Yggdrasil connects to the prime material plane, Gladsheim, the home of the Norse gods, the lower planes of Hades and Niflheim, and many others, with it being said that the roots and branches of the world ash reach out to most of the worlds of the prime material plane, which if so is simply mind-boggling as there are countless worlds, so many different forms of world and world-like environments. Yggdrasil is more obvious on some worlds than others. It may have to do with how closely such worlds align with the Norse gods' ideals, or perhaps it's just ambient, natural, magical energy. Who knows? On some worlds you can actually see the world ash stretching away and around the planet's atmosphere and growing beyond, not often to deep space but seeming to fade away like smoke in wild space. The roots are similar but tend to be found on the lower planes and are subject to attack constantly by a massive dragon called Nidhogger. Now, unlike a lot of other worms of Norse mythology, Nidhogger does fly, but some accounts um, have him with feathered wings, and he's fated to survive Ragnarok and terrorize the worlds of the Prime Material Plane in the age that follows the battle in Twilight of the Norse gods. And that's directly quoted from University of Colorado's Dr. Jackson Crawford, who you can find on YouTube and is an amazing wealth of information on Old Norse literature, legend and language. Go check him out. In some places, travel on the world ash is like climbing a massive tree. Gravity may shift, however, when a branch nears the trunk or and on the trunk itself it feels the traveller like they're walking on a world made of wood, with soil formed from composted wood, moss, leaves and the activities of countless organisms found on the tree, including giant beetles. The landscape is not as uniform as one might think, it undulates. It's not always a steady curve around the trunk, there are mountains that are new branches starting to grow off towards some new demi-plane or other. There are fresh streams teeming with vitality, running down valleys which form as cracks in the bark. Rainbow mists float in the plummeting plumes of waterfalls and gather in secret pools below. There are natural caves that form, just as water eats away over tens of thousands of years into limestone, it also eats into the layered and richly coloured bark. There are many settlements, fortresses, cultivated fields and epic wooden monuments with thousands of species and cultures, and among them all, there are the Ratatoska, native to Yggdrasil and perfectly adapted to it. So today, let's get to know this race, who so famously share the secrets of everyone else, but so rarely share their own. According to mythological folklore, 
They are all descended from Ratatoska, the primal entity who seems to just be part of the tree. Because where there are trees, there are squirrels. And the understanding of this caused him to just exist. Manifested from the astral stuff. Ratatoska is thus a spiritual entity, a divine being. However, the Ratatoska people don't think of him as their creator god. They consider Yggdrasil to be their god, and quite rightly so. Many of them believe that they were spawned from pods in Yggdrasil, and they will fight anybody who disagrees with them. Even those who now dwell in other planes, such as Arborea and the Feywild, Arvandor and Isgard, they believe this too. Radicoster is like a ideal. The folk tales they have which feature him are about how he represents the things that Rotatuskura admire. They refer to him by his name Drilltooth, which is most widely accepted translation, direct translation of the word Radatoskur. Now, although Drilltooth is part of Yggdrasil, existing on it, feeding on it, traveling expertly across the entire expanse, he is still not considered to be a major divine entity, despite the stupendous power of Yggdrasil, because Ratatoska is the world tree's version of Loki. His role is to run up and down the world ash, telling slanderous gossip and provoking hostility between the eagles on high and the serpents below. Now, this has both a very simple meaning and also a deeply complicated one. So let's start with the simple part. European tree squirrels will sound a scolding alarm call in response to danger, and if you're a hunter sneaking along after your prey, this chattering alarm call is a real pain in the ass. And it's not hard to imagine the squirrel is doing this on purpose to mess up your hunt and is really saying nasty things about you. In Viking sagas, a person who helps stir up or keep feuds alive by ferrying words of malice between the participants is seldom one of high status, so Ratatoska is not a god nor a hero, he's a straight up shit stirring prankster who manifests the feisty and puckish energy, the irrepressible and irreverent aspect of vitality. He is the overly caffeinated son of a bitch who just simply loves to upset the apple cart and keep things in motion, never more satisfied than when everything gets chaotic and dangerous, where his speed and cleverness can be put to good use. This is an interesting character in folklore, both admirable for their devil may care and prankster attitude, because what they do is undeniably funny, but also a character that has a streak of malice, no real reverence or respect for the more somber side of things, and one that can be very destructive, getting a kick out of provoking a lot of anger and mounting frustration directed at him which then lashes out at others as they cont he continually escapes the consequences of his actions. As the hunter, their deer alerted by the squirrel's noise, fires their arrow at the squirrel who darts easily away, and the hunter wastes an arrow off for nothing, or perhaps ends up with a measly squirrel for a sorry meal. If you keep referring back to that core situation, you will stay true to the real power of Ratatoska, that core feeling which drives the folklore, the emotion and the lesson it includes. The squirrel is not being a villain, and so Ratatoska are not inherently evil people, but oh my can they stir up a lot of shit. Most recently, Cobalt Press has published a series of articles that I reference a lot in what follows, so big thanks to Brian Suskind, and please check out the links below to his articles online so you can get the full picture of what I'm referencing. I'll be taking a closer look at the Tome of Beasts and the Creature Codex stat blocks for the two Ratatoska subspecies, as well as the original source material from Planescape, how those differ in some significant ways, but I'm going to be combining them all to make three workable sub-races of the Ratatoska that you can use as player characters or NPCs as you see fit. Yggdrasil is stupendously large, and I see no reason why multiple Ratatoska species could not exist. So we can have a tiny Ratatosk, with an emphasis on their mystical powers over gossips and secrets. We can have a larger but still small species of non-flying Ratatosk who fancy themselves as the defenders of Yggdrasil and her squirrel people. And finally, the old school and original AD&D flying squirrel version of the Ratatosk, which is a bit of a blend of the other two, but is really the primal original, original version. Before we look at the specifics of each sub-race, all Ratatoskas share a plus two to their dexterity attribute as player characters. Dark vision out to 60 feet, they speak their own language, they can learn the language of birds, which I'm going to interpret as meaning they have the cultural option of selecting the Auron language. Uh, of elemental air, and most know the common tongue of the plain of Isgard, which is also spoken by the Barrior. They have a ground movement and natural climbing space speed of 30 feet per round, 
This may vary with the different subspecies. They have a natural claw and special bite attack that makes use of their tusk teeth to make a gore attack. They can also unleash a supernaturally effective string of insults that acts almost exactly the same as the vicious mockery cantrip. The target only needs to hear the ratatos, not be seen by them, but still be within 60 foot range of the enchantment effect. The ratatos unleashes a string of insults laced with magic at a single target. A shared language is not required, but the target must have above animal level of intelligence, so they must understand they're being insulted. The victim makes a wisdom saving throw DC 15 or takes 1d4 psychic damage and will have disadvantage on the next attack roll it makes before the end of its next turn against any target, not just the Ratatosk in question. The most common alignment among the Ratatosk, if you follow such thing, and I would say the alignment of their society in general is chaotic good, some would say chaotic neutral at times. The most common sub-race of the Ratatoska are the gliding natives of Yggdrasil. They appear to be four to five foot tall flying squirrels with a spark of intelligence in their eyes. They have furry membranes between their arms and legs they use to glide and a flattened tail they can use to steer themselves while in the air. Their black, grey, red or brown fur is usually the only clothing they wear aside from the harness for gear and often protective helmets. Males will often carry a slim dagger, which is more often used as a tool than a weapon for cutting leaves and bark and things. They have plus one to their wisdom as a player character race and very keen senses, gaining advantage on perception checks for hearing or smell, plus they can glide at 50 feet per round, losing 5 feet of height for every 10 feet of movement. However, later in this video I'll give you some ideas on how to greatly enhance the flight of the Ratatoska and make it a real source of wonder in your games. Most of what I describe about their culture is derived from the base stock of gliding Rototosca. The other subspecies are more like different clans, bloodlines that have been isolated by culture or distance over a long period of time and now have a few notable physical and cultural differences, so they can all interbreed with each other, only their social mores and customs stand in the way of this usually. The next most common subrace is the Messenger Ratatoska. Some call them the Miniature Ratatoska or the Celestial Ratatoska, but their name, the actual name amongst their own kind, is the Ekor. They tend to dwell closer to the canopy and the portals to the celestial planes, but they're also the Ratatoska that travel very widely and have the closest connection to Yggdrasil as her messengers. They gain a plus one to their charisma attribute as player characters and have the power to cast message as an at-will spell-like ability. If we flip over to the Tome of Beasts from Cobalt Press, the Ratatoska are found on page 319. They are tiny, chaotic neutral celestials with a natural armor class of 14. 12 d4 plus 12 for a maximum of 60 and a listed average of 42 hit points. Because of their tiny size, they only have a speed of 20 feet walking or climbing. They can not glide, but are highly agile with a dexterity of 18. They also have the ability called Skitter, which just means that they can make the dash, disengage or hide action as a bonus action on each of their turns. They're cunning, somewhat arrogant, but highly intelligent with an intelligence of 17. Their charisma is also 18, but the strength is only 4. They have bonuses to the skills of deception, persuasion and stealth. As celestial creatures, they have resistance, so half damage from bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage from non-magical weapons and other sources. They speak a celestial, the common tongue of Arborea and Esgard, and have telepathy out to a range of 100 feet. They have innate spellcasting, using their charisma attribute for a save DC of 14. Their spellcasting requires no components except speech. At will, they can cast Animal Messenger, Message, and Vicious Mockery. Once each per day, they can cast Commune and Mirror Image, and three times each per day, they can cast Sending and Suggestion. They have a supernatural ability called Divisive Chatter that can take the place of the race's equivalent of Vicious Mockery, since they get that as a spell anyway. It recharges on a result of 5 or 6 on a d6 roll each round, has a DC 14 Charisma saving throw, or up to 6 creatures within 30 feet of the Ratatosk, that can hear the chatter and fail the save will be affected as if by the confusion spell. An affected target can't take reactions and they must roll a d10 at the start of each of its turns to determine its behavior for that uh, turn on the chart found under the spell description. The targets get to make another saving throw to break free of the effect at the start of each of their turns, otherwise it will last for one full minute maximum. This ability counts as using an action. They can also make a physical gore attack with their tusks and their psychic power. 
They are plus 6 to hit one target, inflict 1 piercing damage, but also 4d6 psychic damage and the target must make a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or be charmed in a limited way by the Ratatosk for one round, during which time they will automatically consider one randomly determined ally of theirs as their enemy, perhaps even attempting to dive in the way of an attack leveled at the Ratatosk who just charmed them. Their final ability is a reaction called Desperate Lies. A creature that can hear the Ikor must make a DC 14 wisdom saving throw when it attacks the Ikor. If the saving throw fails, the creature still attacks, but it must choose a different target creature. An ally must be chosen if no other enemies within the attack's range or reach. If no other target is in the attack's range or reach, the attack is still made and ammunition or spell slot is expended if appropriate, but it automatically misses and has no effect. The Celestial Echor are insatiable tricksters and love to challenge others to word games, riddles, rap battles and the old Norse tradition of flighting or flitting, which is a contest consisting of an exchange of insults between two parties often conducted in verse. It's not too difficult to lose these contests to the Ratatosk if all you can come up with is references on how they look like squirrels and eat nuts, so it pays to be creative. They will appreciate it and there are no better guides to the world ash and to the planes it connects to than the Ratatoska, so don't make the mistake of thinking you can just let them win and get on their good side as they tend to help those they respect more than those they think are idiots. If a Ratatosk offers a challenge of a flighting to a character, they already have some measure of respect for the individual because flighting is a hobby they perform among their own kind usually. Celestial Ratatoska are a bit more accepting of other planar races. They're on good terms with the native inhabitants of Yggdrasil and many of the Fey who visit. They can tolerate the Barrior and the Elves, but most other planar races are considered trespassers on the sacred world ash, including dwarves, humans, Githyanki, goblins, orcs, giants and giantkin, and the Yugoloths and Wyrms who dwell on the roots of the world tree, and the angels and archons who guard the upper reaches of the canopy. They don't quite like their presence. Next up we have the Ratatoskar Warlords, they're called the Tradvakt, the largest subrace who have become natives of the heroic plains of Arborea and Isgard. Many are also found along the outer reaches of Yggdrasil's branches that connect to the largest forests of those plains where unfortunately they're prey for giant eagles, giant wolves, giant owls and of course giants, who don't seem to realise that the squirrel folk are sentient creatures and they spit roast them like rabbits. For this reason, the Tradvakt have grown pretty fierce and strong comparative to the other subraces and consider themselves the protectors of all Ratatoska and Yggdrasil, travelling to any instances where either are threatened to do battle. Do not underestimate the fighting ability of a large group of the Warlords. They are also celestial in nature and have resistance to non-magical weapon attacks. They also have telepathy up to 100 feet and maintain secret watchtowers and sprawling suspended cities underneath the World Ashes branches. They also have well-established portals linking across Yggdrasil and have countless hidden safe bores in the bark of the tree where travellers have a safe night's rest. Convincing a Tradvakt that a particular traveller is not a servant of darkness is sometimes quite a difficult task since they see danger and demons everywhere. They're still small in size, but wear lightweight and intricately carved wooden breastplates and carry leaf-bladed short spears that they're very proficient at fighting with. They have an armor class of 16, 14d6 plus 28 for a maximum of 112 and an average listed 77 hit points, 25 foot walking or climbing speed and plus 1 to the constitution attribute as a playable character race. They have plus 7 bonus to their dexterity saving throws, which some have said looks like they just dodge missiles as they leap through the air, and have plus 5 to their wisdom saving throws from the iron will and determination. They have a plus 7 to their acrobatic skill check and plus 4 to intimidation checks. Their coordination in battle and their reputation with other Ratatosk is such that as a bonus action, the Ratatosk Warlord can command one Ratatosk within 30 feet of it to make one melee attack as a reaction. They also share the nimble skittering ability of the Celestial Ratatoska, able to make the dash or disengage action as a bonus action on each of their terms. Note though that unlike their smaller kin, they can't use the hide action in this way. 
They make two attacks per round and have a special attack that recharges on a result of five or six on a d6 roll each round called the Chatter of War, where each non ratatos creature within 30 feet that they can hear the Warlord must succeed on a DC 15 Charisma saving throw or have disadvantage on all attack rolls until the start of the Warlord's next turn. They, they attack at plus seven to hit with their short spear that can also be thrown 20 feet or with a long range throw of 60 feet Still plus seven, but hitting with a disadvantage on the attack roll, rolling 2d20 and taking the lowest result of the two dice. Finally, they have the tusked teeth that deliver quite a nasty gore attack, plus seven to hit, doing 1d4 plus four piercing damage and 4d6 psychic damage. Their claws are great for climbing and intimidation, but they only inf deliver one or two points of damage and are rarely used in combat except against each other in sort of ritualistic fights. Now before I talk about their culture a bit more, I should mention the technology and mystic forces they employ before you come away with the impression that this native species of one of the most powerful living entities in the multiverse are just simple scampering tricksters with a few magic and psychic abilities. While the Ratatoska have no great skill at forging or crafting metal, some would say none, they are pretty clever carvers and are capable of crafting wondrous items from the living wood of Yggdrasil itself. One of which is their seed pod data craft. The giant seed pods of Yggdrasil are sterile and produced in uh, the upper canopy in large numbers. They're highly valued by the Ratatoska. They will take them as currency, as their services as guides. As a source of nutrition and a building material, they're pretty good. The pods have a bulging seed mass towards where the stem attaches to the ash tree with two leaf-like fins that grow together and taper to a point which twists to form a wing surface that causes the pod to spin around as it drops and drive the pod deep into the dirt below. Well, the Ratatosk cut into the seed part of the pod, hollow it out and install a gyroscopic rod and a seat and a steering fin and use a simple runic enchantment to provide levitation to the pod and with that they have a simple one-person flying craft of remarkable agility in the air that you can see darting past, spinning rapidly with a soft whirring sound. Many refer to them as dart pods or just darts. Sadly, they're only really suitable for small-sized humanoids because the pods just don't grow big enough for medium-sized or larger to fit in them. Redditos can also craft enchanted wooden armor and weapons that have many of the same properties as leather and metal versions. The living wood of Yggdrasil only re remains so in close proximity to the world ash, and while it's alive, it can't be burnt. But there is plenty of fallen twigs and old leaves and such to provide firewood for its inhabitants. The only thing the Ratatoska will light a fire for, apart from light, is for cooking giant eagle eggs. <laughs> they uh, eat meat, but the bulk of their diet consists of nuts, roots, berries, fruits, insects, growing bark and tender leaves as well as the tender new shoots that Yggdrasil grows in response to planar activity. The Ratatoska have great reverence for the world ash and never waste any of her resources. Don't forget, to them, she's a god. Although the supply seems endless, they are still conservative about that. Ratatoska cities are rare as by nature they are a wandering and restless people who can simply gnaw a small burrow into the bark and rest within it. Their darker fluffy tail, the same colour as the bark, seals the entrance, traps the warmth inside and conceals them quite well. They do sleep for much longer periods of time in the colder months, though not fully hibernating, they tend to bulk up and store food for these times of year. When they do build larger settlements, the bridges they make to connect pod houses and the larger structures and the, the ropes they make to hold it all together tend to be built to not hold the weight of larger creatures. The pods won't drop when parts of the structure snap or break, but medium and certainly large sized creatures are in dire danger of plummeting, unless they're warned. The Ratatoska don't really care much about other races. They may endanger their own lives and risk all for the most flippant reasons, but they never put their children and family at risk and will fight fiercely to protect them. Some have described their group combat style as panicked, but in truth, it's just chaotic and takes advantage of vertical space and three-dimensional maneuvers, <laughs> otherwise known as leaps and scampers. The Ratatosk move erratically in hit and fade style, but they stagger those movements to form a constant assault that can overpower opponents that are much powerful than they are, and while fending off the incoming attacks by giving the opponents disadvantage on all their attack rolls, and the Ratatosk tend to constantly hide and hit them with confusion spells and things. 
Delving into the material from Cobalt Press, I'll quote from the articles posted online with a few tweaks and additions here and there of my own, which is my usual way. Rotatoska are not solitary creatures, they live in close matriarchal family groups called scurries. The squirrel folk are proud of their heritage and each Rotatos can recite tales of their lineage all the way back to their hero Drilltooth. The eldest female of each scurry sits on a council, maintaining order and resolving disputes within their dray, which is a Rattatos settlement. Occasionally, the council will appoint a war leader to lead a raid against a nearby threat, but its most important duty is to host the Sakmut, the daily gathering, usually in the morning, where the Rattatos gather to exchange news and gossip, which is vital to their society. Information from across the plains filters down to the Sakmut. A common Ratatosk adage states, the softest whisper in the furthest nook of the endless void will eventually be repeated in the smallest Sakmut. There are no secrets for the Ratatosk, only stuff they don't know yet. The exchange of news and gossip is routine and expected between individuals, and indeed no real business is ever conducted by a Ratatosk before secrets are shared in any capacity. Personal property is more of a vague guideline to the Ratatosk rather than an established law, they think nothing of borrowing something shiny or interesting which they fully intend to return if they do not get distracted. If this gives you the impression that they're a lot like the Kinder race of Kryn, they're not too far off the mark, but they're a lot less accepting of those who are not native to the world tree, so they don't get much of an opportunity to steal from visitors because visitors are rare. Visitors to a dray may feel bombarded with intrusive questions from the ever-curious squirrel folk. Older Ratatosk will try not to borrow items from non ratatosk but the younger members of a dray may not be so restrained, they just don't think about it. If it's left lying about, obviously nobody is using it, and they will satisfy the curiosity and or put it to better use. Being hauled up sharply and berated by an outsider for just touching something they left lying about will not win the affection or trust of the Ratatosk being reprimanded or those around them. They're liable to sling insults and lash out in response to the aggression. Life in a Ratatosk dray is boisterous. It's a chittering place full of warm hearths, food, music, and stories to their friends, and death by a thousand sharp tusks and spear tips to their enemies. The drays themselves are small affairs consisting of a dozen scurries and are hidden in scattered locations up and down the length of Yggdrasil. The Tradvakt often camp in the drays and provide protection while the majority of the community is made up of gliding Ratatoska and the much smaller but greatly respected Ikor and a few members of other planar races such as the occasional halfling, fairy or one of the many exotic and largely unknown native races of the world ash including several peaceful insect folk and the raven folk who are quite different from Kenku and I'll probably talk about them later. Typical settlements consist of a few exterior freestanding buildings fashioned out of discarded world tree bark and tucked into the crook of two or more massive branches along the great number of pods that are used for sleeping and storage and these structures are cleverly camouflaged and require DC 15 perception check just to spot. The stout wall of woven vines and branches gives the squirrel folk a protective barrier against the occasional monster or raider and the weather. The exterior buildings provide accommodation for visiting guests and a marketplace to trade with much more sturdy construction as it's safer for larger folk to walk on and climb because they're expecting visitors to go there. Beyond these structures, the squirrel folk live in a network of halls, pod domiciles, burrows, store pods, workshops and public spaces carved out of the world tree. They take great care to keep their tunnels within the outermost layer of Yggdrasil's bark so as not to harm the great tree. Each dray has two buildings in common, which is the Feasting Hall to host the Sakmut and a temple or shrine dedicated to Drilltooth, often built like a small amphitheater where the priests tell stories, particularly to the young. When Ratatoska children reach adulthood, they exhibit a wanderlust that few other races understand, well the burial sometimes do. Most simply explore Yggdrasil, gathering rumours and secrets from the upper canopy down to the roots, meeting many strange travellers and inhabitants along the way. Ratatoska often offer their services as guides to planet travellers, seeing it as an easy way to learn more gossip. The largest Ratatosk dray is Grenstad, home to 4,000 Ratatosk and a smattering of other races. The city rests at the heart of the Great Branching, a union of five world tree segments, and hosts the squirreling court of Yggdrasil, the acorn palace of Queen Clara Hecarina, who, uh, as well as the famed Echelon Hale Feast Hall. 
Another famous stray is Oripel. This magical hidden stronghold of 500 is situated near the Well of Erd and sends scouts to risk oblivion to spy upon the forces of darkness, including the many hags who call the World Ash their home. The cunning hags are well aware of the Radatosk interlopers, of course, and occasionally use their eavesdropping to unofficially pass on information amongst themselves. The Radatosk cultural cuisine is dominated by muesli and a rich nut stew called greiter sweetened with honey and spices. They also eat berries and flowered bulbs grown in gardens. Ratatoska love the sweets and foods of the Prime Material Plane, which can be traded and exchanged for goods or services like pies, candies and sweetmeats, so just like money. They don't tend to drink alcohol. The greiter they uh, mead that they make is more like a golden brown sweet and spicy healing potion that they brew from their leftover food. One interesting aspect of their boisterous culture is that every day is some form of holiday or festival among the Ratatoska. They love festivals and, and named holidays and things. They're always raising their glass about something or other. The names of which are just too numerous to go into any depth. You can write a book on them. But a few of their traditions are very interesting and quite famous. The first of which is Viskarmut. Viskarmut. The uh, four month long contest of champions from each community who set out on the first day of harvest tide and then four months later on the last day of snowfall they gather in Dray, uh, in the Dray of Greenstad to publicly present their secrets to the squirrel court before returning home to great fanfare and celebration. Visitors, both mortal and divine, are expected and often attend the sharing of secrets to hear the Ratatosk's stolen lore. <laughs> you can imagine the problems this causes. Another spectacular event is the Falskarm. <laughs> Held during the first week of high summer, the Falskarm commemorates the infamous Ratatosk heroine Chur Skurida, who brought a vital cure to a disease from the top of Yggdrasil to a Ratatosk community near the base by leaping off the top of the world tree to honour her memory, participants in the Falskarm don specially made winged garments and hurl themselves from one of the highest Ratatosk settlements. The individual who reaches the lowest point of Yggdrasil without crashing on branches or trunk, succumbing to aerial monsters or tumbling into the void, receive great fame among the Ratatoska as well as a prize given by Queen Clara Hikarina. In the past, the prize has been rare magical items gathered from across the plains, but it's widely acknowledged secret that the winner of the Falskarm can instead request the answer to a single question from Vedfolnir, the all-seeing divine eagle at the top of Yggdrasil. The traditional naming conventions of the squirrel folk put the emphasis on a forename given to a child at birth. The Ratatosk make no differentiation between male and female names. They tend to have three syllables such as Chir Atha or Naj Ita Uri, but highly respected families occasionally add ific, uh, infixes like E or Ike to create longer names for like more, you know, import. They'll also have a second name that relates to them in a descriptive nickname, such as Bright Eyes or Silent Poor. Ratatos who dwell in outer plains will often take on regional naming conventions. Ratatoska visiting or dwelling on the Prime Material Plane really don't like places that are too cold, too hot, or don't have any trees. They tend to suffer deeply, spiritually and physically when away from the forest, unable to rest fully, very tense, on edge. They won't find any Ratatoska living in a desert or manning a sailing ship for any length of time, and though they can travel through such environments easily enough, they just don't dwell there. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of the clever little scamps, learned a lot of secrets, it's only fair. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my subscribe star or Patreon for all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some Teespring merchandise. Wear your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.